There's a common saying, uh, this has been years ago and when I started my business, that you should charge what you are worth. Charge what you're worth. It sounds good, right? I mean, why, why wouldn't you charge what you're worth? Are you playing small? Are you uh, underselling yourself? These terms all have this foundational assumption that your worth or your self-esteem is connected to your rates or your fees. I think it's a very dangerous assumption and I'm calling it out. I'm bringing forth to light because I needed to really look at this in order to find a way to price my services that felt authentic and sustainable and this associated with my self-worth because hey if someone charges five times more than you are they worth more than you now you might say well their bank account is worth more than my bank account fine their time seems to be worth more in the market than my time fine but it's so dangerous and um, it, it creates an unhealthy dynamic between your pricing, your customers, and how you think of yourself when you start thinking, oh, if uh, as I, um, you know, someone who charges more is, is, is worth more, even, even to say their time is worth more is, I think, dangerous and unnecessary. Because what are you worth? What are you worth? No one can say. As a human being, you are worth infinity. No one can put a price on you. Now, you say, George, that's fine and good, but what does that mean for how I charge? Well, the most common alternative that's better than charge what you're worth is to charge the market rate. That's, that's better because you look around at other people who offer the same kind of services you do to the same kinds of people that you do, and that's your market. Your market is the group of transactions from people offering something similar to you with a similar background to the customers that are similar to your customers. That's your market. And whatever the rates are being charged in your market, that's the market rate. And it makes sense to charge the market rate because, well, your market, your customers or your potential clients expect a certain range for what these kinds of services are charged by people like you. So charge the market rate is if you want to just make a real simple rule of thumb, you can move on from here. That's fine. Now, what I've noticed, though, is a lot of people in my industry of business coaching, they teach you how to you know, make money and do your marketing. What they tend to do is charge what the market will bear. And in, they might even teach that to you. In fact, that's a common economics uh, theory. Is to or the economic observation is that companies, firms charge what the market will bear. And I just think that is so adversarial between the business and the customer. It sets up this situation where, as a business owner, I'm going to try to take as much money from you as possible. And as a customer, you are supposed to buyer beware. You know, just to be suspicious of every business and go, well, I'm going to pay you the least. I'm going to pay the least possible to the business owner as I can. Right. It's an adversarial relationship. And it's not how most of us here, heart based solopreneurs, want to relate to our clients and our potential clients. I mean, you, you wouldn't want me to be charging the most that you can bear. That doesn't make, doesn't make you feel good. It doesn't make me feel good either, actually. Now, it makes me feel like I'm getting away with something and I'm like you know, being devious or 
um, just not community oriented, not doing business from love, from compassion. Another common teaching is to charge what your work is worth. What is your work worth? Charge that amount of money. That's very similar to charge what the market will bear. Because let's say you are a, um, I don't know, let's say you are a relationship coach and you help, you help a couple, uh, a married couple, let's say, to stay together instead of divorce. Well, how much is that worth? <laughs> how much is that worth? That could be worth well, whatever the couple makes, you know, in their, in their, that could be worth tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Are you going to charge that? No, that's ludicrous. You don't charge what your work is worth because your work is actually worth more than you can, you, you, than, than you realize. So you can't even calculate what your work is worth because the ripple effect that it creates on a customer's, a client's life. And then they go on and create ripple effect in their life to all the people that they interact with. How can you possibly charge what your you know, your, your, your work is worth. You can't, I mean, it's, it's worth way more. So what should we do? Like I said, we come back to charge the market rate, I think is a fair assumption because you are simply doing what is standard with the others around you. Now, here's the thing though. I, several years ago, I came to this realization that I want to take as little money from my clients as I possibly could. So instead of charge what the market will bear, I charge the least that I can bear. That's what I started doing in 2014. That's been, that's, you know, kind of started that experimentation. So back then, uh, my courses were, were less money. My one-on-one -on -one time was less. I was charging the least I possibly could bear and still provide my service. Now, some of you are probably going to be, you know, they, some of you probably disrespect that and say, no, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a bad business move, George, because then you're not making as much money as you could. I know because my models and, you know, my heroes uh, primarily Peace Pilgrim. You may, some of you may have heard me talk about her. Um, if you don't know about Peace Pilgrim, I recommend that you go online and search for Peace Pilgrim audiobook. Peace, like world peace. Pilgrim, like pilgrimage. Peace Pilgrim audiobook and listen to it. It's free to listen to. And this is one of my biggest heroes in life. And I was deeply affected by her story and her teachings um, when I changed my business back in 2012, 2013, 2014. And so I started charging the least that I could possibly charge. I, what that forced me to do was to really look at what was enough for me. That's not something you usually hear from people who teach you business, marketing, pricing. I've already said what they typically say, charge what the market will bear, charge at market rate, charge what, you're, you know, charge what you're worth, charge what your time is worth, charge what your work is worth, all that stuff, right? What I say is look at what is enough. Look at what is enough for you, which is, which is a constant inquiry. It's not a one-time Okay, this much amount of money per month, you know, inflation and your life changes, your, your needs change. But without looking at what is enough, and if you just keep on studying business and marketing, you're going to keep, you're going to, to, to keep the, you're going to feel pressured to inflate your prices more and more and more every single year, every six months, every three months, some people might say. And doing that, what does that do? Continuing to inflate our prices consistently beyond what is enough for us. Okay. Now, I, I'm going to say, I'm, what I'm not saying 
is that you shouldn't save for retirement. I save for retirement, of course. I'm, um, I try to aggressively save for retirement. Not, I'll, I'll say more. I, I, I don't. What I don't do is what some people I've noticed try to do is like they try to make a bunch of money in just a few years so that they can retire and then they can say, well, now I don't have financial pressure. I can provide my service for free or low cost or whatever. I admire if that was the intention, I admire that. But what typically happens is during the years of making a lot of money, they turn into a shark because how you make money shapes your character, shapes your character. It shapes your habits of thought and relationships with others, how you look at people. So we need to be aware of that. Like I said, most of the people you learn from in my industry will turn you into a shark. It will turn you against your own values. And what I'm trying to bring you back to is to, is to invite you to observe your own values again and say, okay, I don't need to try to take as much money from other people as possible. Because when we, when we take more money from others, others have more financial pressure, right? And then we tend to, what happens? The hedonic treadmill, you can look that up as well. The hedonic treadmill means that when we take more money in, we tend to increase our own lifestyle if we're not very conscious about managing our money, which most people are not. So we tend to increase our lifestyle costs rather than decrease them. I mean, look at what I've done recently, which I've been dreaming of doing for five years, which is to move to a cheaper country. I just made the move from San Francisco, California, one of the most expensive cities in the whole world. It's really top 10 most expensive city to live in. But I had to live there because, you know, my wife, my wife's work was there. And, you know, we, we couldn't leave because of the, her livelihood circumstances. But finally, the pandemic and, you know, she was able to work online a lot more. And now we, we had the freedom to leave. So finally, now we made the move to Mexico, where uh, right now <laughs> the costs are, are, you know, trying to settle into a new home. And there's, there's additional costs there that we didn't usually have. But I'm expecting that in the coming year, the cost of my lifestyle will go down dramatically dramatically, probably at least a third, if not half, and maybe even more than half. So what does that mean? Does that mean I can save more money and, um, and retire sooner? And so this is what I'm trying not to do. Now, you know, um, bear with me here, if you don't mind. The typical teaching from guys like me is make as much money as fast as you can so that you can retire to Mexico or Thailand or, or you know, some tropical island or whatever, wherever you want to go, you know, retire somewhere where you can just live off your savings, your investments, and live a good life. I talk about this elsewhere where a good life, in my opinion, is not sitting on the beach, you know, sipping your favorite drink. You could do that, of course, to rest and relax and renew and take as long as you need to. But in my opinion, a good life it's about challenging ourselves on a daily basis. You know, of course, you balance it with rest and renewal and, you know, all that stuff. But you, you, a, good, a truly good life is to continue challenging ourselves to explore what is most authentic to our calling, which usually means, always, almost always means to serve other people more impactfully, more deeply. And... By the way, money is not evil. This is also important. If you come from the assumption that money is the root of all evil, just like the Bible says, George, money is the... No, that's a misconception. Money, if you... I have a video about that, by the way. Go to YouTube and search money is the root of all evil. And you should find one of my, you should find one of my old, old videos where I talk about um, what I understand to be the true biblical, for those of you who are biblical, right, the, the, the true biblical interpretation of that. Um, but set, set that aside. Um, not all of us are, are uh, take the Bible as the, as the you know, word of God. But uh, what I believe is money is not the root of all evil. But the greed, greed is the root of many kinds of evil, right? So that, and that, by the way, is so 
we are also susceptible to it, especially it's kind of like you, if you get desperate, whether you're desperate or you are le less desperate and making a lot of money, like financially desperate or the other side, <laughs> greed can grab you at, at both ends of the spectrum. And like, it just seeps into you. And when you learn from people, from guys like me, you will get greed left and right. It will be like seeping into you and you won't even realize it. So what happens is what I try to do, okay, which I've done now, it, I'm showing you, right? Like in, for, through my own lifestyle is I have, I have um, what do you call it? Um, downsized, that's the right word. I, I have nothing in storage. I have no storage fees. Uh, we sold or gave away, gave away most of our stuff, most of our furniture, most of our stuff. We donated it. Uh, we try to sell a few things at very cheap. And then we, unfortunately, some things had to be trashed because we had to leave, leave the home. So we downsized tremendously so that in the next year or so, our, our financial situation will become um, easier, less pressure, which means, guess what? I'm, that, guess what? My business, I'm not going to, um, you know, I, I, I probably will work a little bit less because I've, I've been working quite a bit over the last 10 years. But I'll probably work a little bit less hours per week, but but still working probably more focused time than most solopreneurs, more focused hours per week than probably most solopreneurs with them. I practice joyful productivity for many years. So anyway, I'm going to keep working. And you know where I'm going to do with the money? I'm going to give it back to you. Yeah, that's my plan. I already have, those of you who are in my affiliate program know, I have 300 affiliates. Um, uh, at any given time, something like 50 to 100 are active affiliates, and the active affiliates are the ones I'm sharing profit with. So let me say this again. Most of the money I make has a profit-sharing component where I share 40%. I share 40% of my online course revenue, which is most of my revenue. My online course revenue, I share 40% with my affiliates every month. 25% directly from whatever they sold, but another 15% where I just distribute it among all the active affiliates. So I try to give money back to my affiliates, which are my, by, by the way, most of my affiliates are you, uh, just my clients and custom, my students who sign up for the affiliate program. You can go to georgecow.com slash affiliate, single word, georgecow.com slash affiliate to see what the affiliate program is about. Anyway, that's my plan. As I reduce my living expenses, I'm going to keep re investing in retirement, but I'm not going to, here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do this thing where I'm like, I'm going to make as much money, invest as aggressively as I can so that I can then retire early, you know, retire young. No, I'll, I'll tell you why. Because during, during my money-making years, I can either, like I said, become a shark or become super frugal and like, stingy essentially right become a shark and become stingy and try to like save as much money i'm not am i criticizing the fire movement financial independence retire early i kind of am i know some of you are really into that movement but hear hear me out i think retirement i think it is healthy let me say this i think it's healthy for the soul to be working as much as possible now he said george are you a puritan Maybe I have a little pure puritanism in me. Maybe I do. But here's hear, hear me out a little bit here. Why is working healthy for the soul? Because work, okay? Let me, let me be clear. Working for money. Working for money, okay? I think is healthy for the exploration of our calling. Why is that? Why? Let me explain why. Because from my perspective, our calling, our work calling like what we are called by a higher power to do for money is this the where our interests and our skills on the one hand intersect with what the world is yearning to pay for what what's the what is the world yearning to pay for your world is yearning to pay for what cannot come for free you see what i mean if, if I can get something for free, I'm not going to pay for it. No one's going to pay for what they can get for free, but they will pay for what cannot be gotten for free. And so, in other words, there's something that they want and they can't get for free. 
that circle of what the market wants and to pay for and what your skills and interests are, that intersection right there in the middle is your work calling, is the higher purpose of your money-making work life. And that, I believe, really is more authentic and true about the soul's career calling, your, your soulful career calling, than just volunteering. Volunteering, of course, is beautiful. It's wonderful. You, you do things for free. You know, but again, there are things that people that not enough people are volunteering for that people want to pay for, let's say. And when you are able to charge for it, okay, people are, are willing to pay you for it. It's a beautiful intersection. And that's what money, I think, is. That's where money uh, makes the world a better place. That's where money connects humanity. It's to say, you know what? I really want this service. I really want this program. I really want this event. I really want this product. And I can't easily get it for free. No one else is, you know, I can't find it for free, okay? Or easily can't find it. And you are charging for it. I believe in you. You've been, um, you know, you've given me free content or whatever. I'm going to pay you for it because you're charging for it. So, okay, back to, back to what, um, what the topic at hand is. I try to charge based on enoughness like i said as i reduce my lifestyle expenses i will either charge less or i will give more profit back to my back to my affiliates which is people like you you can anyone can sign up for my affiliate program right give give money back to my my active affiliates and i'll probably also either charge less for my stuff or take on or, or launch less launch fewer courses so that i can spend even more energy making the existing courses better that's my plan. So I charge based on enoughness and based on compassion. Because I look at you and I go, I don't want to take more money from you. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm going to take as little money from you as I can bear for the way my business model is set up. And as I get my lift, lifestyle expenses less, and as my business model improves, I should be able to take less money from you and give you as much, if not more value. That's my aim. That's my intention. So I hope this is this discussion helps you see the pricing and money question, such an important one, in a different light. And I look forward to seeing of everything I've said what uh, resonated with you. And if you have anything else to add, of course, feel free to comment below. Thank you so much.